what is the biggest minotaur you faced in your life? Well, for me, I would say it's probably redeeming the loss of my father from heart disease when I was 18. Um, he, he passed of, I mean, heart disease being the, the leading global killer in the world. I think it's, um, for me, it, it strikes a, at a very deep pain point because a lot of people are going through the same thing that I went through currently. And for me, I think it's just making sure that I redeem that as much as possible by educating myself with health and then extending that knowledge and, and wisdom to people who are not so fortunate to, to really dive deep into the, the literature or the work around health. Deep. So that's a great way to start the show. We'll unpack that. But before we do, welcome to another episode of the Minotaur's Maze podcast. My guest today is a leading men's health coach circadian rhythm expert not a doctor but probably should be a doctor Zaid Dahaj thank you for being here how are you thank you brother I'm doing amazing and uh, definitely excited to chop it up on this conversation here brilliant so I mean we, we did get into something deep there straight away so I suppose you know that is quite obviously um you know uh, quite a loss um uh, so like how did you feel during that period and how did you get out of it? Because, you know, a lot of people go through something like that and they never kind of get out of it. Um, I know my own father, when he lost his father, he did go off the rails a little bit. Um, yeah. But how was that experience for you? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely rough. I think um, it, it was an interesting experience because I was in, at the time I was actually in Ireland when that occurred. So I was pursuing professional football or at least trying to. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's extremely tough to go abroad and, and try to play the game with, with people who are way better. But essentially, I think, um, and I was basically away from all my family and friends. Like I had very little contact. I had a few people around me who I just met, but uh, I think that developed a little bit of um, a chip on my shoulder, so to speak, because it was, I was kind of disconnected from the world and everything while that, mm. that was happening. And yeah, I mean, it was a whirlwind, but I think at the end of the day, a lot of these experiences create a stronger character and as a result you can either shy away from that or you can use it to improve your life and other people's lives brilliant brilliant and did you take any you know practical steps or was it just life just carried on and, and you slowly got over it or did you do anything specifically to try and get through that period uh, i say that the anger was a very important tool for me mm. back back then because i was frustrated that such a thing could happen like before that point i never lost somebody close to me especially from a, a, a preventable chronic disease and so mm -hmm. the anger really propelled me into studying various things around health and i'm very fortunate for it to have led me to this point where i can help other gentlemen and other people um, avoid these situations so I, i'd say that anger was a great tool for me then and really just sitting by myself with my thoughts without anything um poisoning so to speak my mind into various directions and so i think the silence and the um the anger was was important for me mm -hmm. and would you say the anger is still there to some extent or is it are you at peace with it at the moment i would say for the most part i am at peace with it but at the same time i don't think something like that ever goes away like the, mm. the pure emotional charge involved with an experience like that, I think that's something you carry for the rest of your life. And for me, it's almost like um, it's almost like a part of my armor now that I carry into the world of battle or whatever, so to speak, because it, it gives me an extra layer of experience that I can use in scenarios of speaking about health or, you know, in, in other facets as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it fits perfectly with the theme of, of, of this podcast. Obviously, you've had your own personal minotaur that you've faced. And from that, you've now got this bigger cause and bigger mission that you want to be a part of, which is obviously helping other men with this preventable disease. So do you want to unpack a little bit about what you've learned in this period and, and why this mission now? Obviously, I see why it's important to you, but why is it important for this society to tackle that and, and maybe segue into what I really want to get into in this conversation, which is about the circadian rhythm, um, because obviously I've been following your content for some time now. And in the back of my mind, I know it's really important to learn about the circadian rhythm, but I know very little about it. Um, yeah. and, and, and even the people that I speak to, very little people know about this and, and, and why it's important. So yeah, just fire away and go, go straight into it. 
Well, I think it's it's very straightforward for me. I think that society right now is is fundamentally sick. I mean, there's dysfunction from left, right, up, down. I mean, everywhere, everywhere you look, there's some sort of dysfunction going on from the health perspective. And so when you consider that, I believe in 2016, there was a study that showed that there are now more overweight and obese people than mm -hmm. underweight people in the world. That gives you sort of a framework and perspective on what kind of problem we're dealing with. And I'm not convinced that it solely comes down to nutrition. I think it plays a big part. But if you study circadian dysfunction and not only how the body works, but how that circadian dysfunction uh, basically reaches its tentacles into other areas of health, then you start to develop a more clear understanding that, okay, maybe the light in our environment and the fact that we're not sleeping is, and some other things as well, is doing more damage than, you know, a bag of Doritos or not exercising or being sedentary. So I really do think that society needs it because we're, we're at a breaking point. And I think that even Dr. Abu Bakri, who we're familiar with on, on Twitter, he mentions that if, if every obese person becomes diabetic, then, you know, just the dialysis needs alone or something that are enough to break the system. So I think that people just need to really develop a healthy relationship with their health. And as a result, we need education because a lot of people are not educated. As a matter of fact, they're educated the other way. They're, mm -hmm. they're taught to be ignorant in these matters. Absolutely. Um, and, and usually when I have these podcasts, it's, it's typically a two-way dance where obviously the, the guest says something and then I put my input in. But with this topic, I'm going to get you to speak the most because there's just so much I need to learn from this as well, rather than offer any kind of insight. So maybe we should start with, with the basics for, for those that are new to this. In the most simplest terms, what is the circadian rhythm for an individual and why is it important to learn about it? Mm. So it's a 24-hour body clock that is oriented according to the sun, according to the solar cycle. So what I want people to understand is that every aspect of our biology is designed to sense light and is built upon the foundation of the circadian rhythm. So when we're talking about metabolism, mental health, energy production, um, mitochondrial function, every aspect of this is built according to, uh, to a circadian mechanism. And what the circadian mechanism is designed to do is basically tell our bodies how to function based off of where it is in time and space with, with light being a big input to that discussion. Um, and so, I mean, you, you cannot find a single aspect of biology that this circadian mechanism does not touch. It's, it's extremely powerful. And I think people are discounting it big time because they're more focused on nutrition or exercise. And while those things are important, let's, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Let's talk about the fundamentals of how the human body was designed whether you have a religious perspective an evolutionary biology perspective i think at the end of the day this is um this is the final frontier of health that's that's something i've said in the past and people kind of perk their ears to that they're like how can this be the final frontier well i mean if you understand that we are circadian creatures at our core then you you really do understand that this is the final frontier that, that we have to tackle and once we do then we can discuss little details around training or nutrition or whatever you want but we really have to get the basics in check right now absolutely and, and and i suppose what would be good to really highlight the the pain points i suppose is what is the impact of an out of line circadian rhythm or if your circadian rhythm isn't right what are some of the symptoms people will be feeling which they might attribute to something else but it's because of this yeah, I'll give you a few examples that come to mind. Number one is that circadian dysfunction independent of sleep loss causes some deleterious effects on insulin resistance and then um, inflammation as well. So it definitely increases chronic inflammation, definitely gets you on the road to becoming a type 2 diabetic. I believe it, it can independently cause type 2 diabetes. Um, and then when you look at other aspects of the research, you find that artificial light is causative of uh, cancer. Many cancers are, are involved with circadian dysfunction. Artificial light at night and metabolism and obesity is a big discussion. It directly causes obesity. Um, and, and this makes sense when you study the foundation of how the body works in regards to the POMC system. So the pro melanocortin system, which fundamentally interacts with light. And as a result, it creates various peptides that are, are actually responsible for being anti-inflammatory, being appetite suppressants. Um, I mean, you could talk about beta endorphin and CART, two peptides that are actually opioid peptides. So 
even mental health is something that I fundamentally mm -hmm. believe is involved with circadian dysfunction. So, I mean, it just depends on, on what you want to focus on because it, it tackles everything really. And, and how would you, if, so as an individual, how would I know whether my circadian rhythm is out of line or that there is a dysfunction or if I'm doing good, if you're, if you've never been in, involved in this or you've never heard of it or you've never studied it, how would you know that this is what you need to look at? Sorry, could you, I think you cut off a little bit. Could you repeat that real quick? Yeah, yeah no worries. So basically, how would an individual know that their circadian rhythm is off? Uh, what, what, kind of, what kind of signs should they, should they look for um, to look into this and, and what steps should they take then to get it into alignment? Mm. I mean, various things. You have low energy, you have crashing in the afternoon after you have a meal, um, unexplained weight gain, your, your mental health has gone out the window, anxiety, depression, you have brain fog, you can't even focus at work for 10 minutes straight. There are various um, signs that you are dysfunctional from a circadian perspective. I think um, there are a few rules of thumb that people can use. If you're under bright artificial light after sunset, that's probably a good sign that you have some circadian dysfunction going on. If you don't get morning sunlight or if you stay inside most of the time, if you lather on sunscreen, you wear sunglasses, you have contact lenses, these are all things that give me an indicator as to how deep the circadian dysfunction is. But nonetheless, we can assume that there is some level of that. Um, and then you asked, how can people address that? Is that correct? Yes. I mean, some very, very basic things like block artificial light past sunset, get morning sunlight in regards to any windows in the environment, whether it's the car or, or inside the home, keep the windows open, even if just cracked slightly. Um, these are various things that you can, you can uh, utilize in order to improve your relationship with light. And I actually brought some things as well. Like you can get a pair of blue light blockers. These are from Midwest Red Light Therapy. These are raw optics, which are basically the apple of blue light blockers. Um, they're literally, literally just charging you $200 for the brand name, but they basically work the same way. And then you have these amber bulbs, very important. And then you have the red bulbs as well. Mm -hmm. And so there are various tools that you can use to become more circadian friendly. And I think that's what people don't think about. They think about, um, how overwhelming the change is going to be. But really, if you just study a little bit and are pointed in the right direction to these companies, you mm -hmm. can create a fantastic relationship with light. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I did see some of your posts, and I, see, I did see some of these lights in, in, in action. So the whole room is, 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 is lit up in red. Um, so let's just take this step by step. Morning routines, obviously, everybody talks about morning routines, and there's some funky ones out there, <laughs> some good ones out there. There's probably a lot of fluff out there. What, from a circadian rhythm perspective, what should be the ideal morning routine and why? That's a good question. I would say waking up right before sunrise so you can actually watch sunrise in its totality. Um, why you want to do that? I mean, it stimulates the production of aromatic amino acids, which are responsible for every neurotransmitter and hormone in your body. So it's basically the, the starting point of producing all of those excellent things for your body. Um, red light spectrum from watching the morning sun is incredible. I mean, we're talking about eye regeneration. We're talking about circadian rhythm alignment. Uh, what else? Better metabolism, improved glucose disposal. Like I said, it touches everything. And then, you know, once you're done watching sunrise, I would say just getting most of your skin exposed to that morning sunlight anywhere between sunrise and then around 9 or 10 a.m., depending on where you are. This is what's actually going to prime your skin so that you can avoid burns via uh, filigrin production, uracanic acid production. Um, and it's a very important part of what I discuss with what we call the solar callus, which is the idea of preparing your body in order to handle more UV during the midday. Mm. Um, so from a, from a morning perspective, I think that's probably the most important thing. Being grounded to a natural earth surface while you're doing these things is especially important. And then uh, trying to avoid any artificial light as well. If you, you're using a laptop, use Flux or Iris or one tap zap that will uh, block the blue light from the, the screen. And then the same thing with the phone as well. Brilliant. And, and we did touch upon this on, on the brief air chat um, discussion that we had the other day. So if you're in a country like, like the UK, where it's just perennially cold, there is hardly any sun, it's raining, it's wet, um, you know, you go out at sunset, you're not going to see the sun. Uh, you'll be lucky to see any light, to be honest, until you're around about eight o'clock anyway, and you're yeah. wrapped up in your, in your woolly hats, your coats. Do you still need to get out? 
um, and, and, and would it still be beneficial or what would you do in those circumstances to, to make sure you get the right kind of exposure to, to light? Well, for people who live in darker environments, especially the UK, I would say it's even more important to get outside immediately after you wake up. It's even more important for you guys to double down on all of these things that I've been talking about on, on Twitter and in Substack and various other platforms because you don't have as much leverage with the solar yield. The sun is just not as strong where you are. And really all life tracks with where you where you are at in the equator. Like if you go to the, maybe the 59th or 60th latitude, there's like very little vegetation that grows there. I mean, I think it's the boreal forest that literally stops at the 60th latitude because the solar yield is, is just not good enough. Um, and so there's that part of the discussion. There's a more controversial and annoying part of the discussion for a lot of people, which is that if you're darker skinned, the likelihood of you developing problems by being in the UK or darker environments is exponentially higher. Um, I mean, it's just fundamentally, it's just about adaptation, like darker skinned people just work better at the equator or closer to it. Um, and so those are just a few things that I would recommend. I think it is certainly a, a very good investment for a darker skinned individual to at least go on vacation closer to the equator. Absolutely. I mean, one of the biggest problems that especially the Southeast Asian community in the UK has is the lack of vitamin D and almost everyone's on vit vitamin D tablets and stuff. Uh, but just for the avoidance of that, a doubt then, even if there is no sun, you still recommend that people should go out early morning and get natural light exposure. Well, you can run the test for yourself. If it's cloudy or if it's rainy, compare the, the uh, what we call the lux so the, the um, magnitude of the light within the environment, and then compare it to the outdoors. What you'll notice is that it's a lot brighter when it's very cloudy outside. I mean, honestly, sometimes where I am, when it's very cloudy, it's honestly much brighter than it is a, a very sunny day, which is mm -hmm. interesting. It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting rabbit hole to go down, but nonetheless, you still have the majority of the full light spectrum available to you, which will then enact all of these beneficial biological adaptations and benefits. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and is there certain parts of the body that should be exposed? I mean, obviously, you know, you can go into the spiritual aspects where there's certain energy levels and chakras and on all of that. Is it just the eyes that need to be exposed or are there certain parts of the body that are stronger or what's your, what's your take on that? I would much prefer that people get both their eyes and as much of their skin in the game as possible because not only are, I think, first of all, your eyes are the gateway to not only the soul, but also various aspects of, of your biology. Um, but the skin is also a very important thing that not a lot of people talk about. I mean, I, I don't come across any people actually who talk about it outside of maybe one or two individuals. But the skin also senses light through these light sensing proteins called non-visual photoreceptors melanopsin being the best example which is a blue light detector i believe it detects blue light at like 420 or 430 nanometers um and so it, it, it's important to understand that basically the skin and eyes are acting in the same way in regards to sensing light so that it can orient yourself in, in time and space and um this is basically why you just want to get as much of your skin exposed even if it's a little bit cold i think that there are benefits to that cold exposure to some degree obviously you can take it to, too far but um, yeah, eyes and skin in the game. And then one thing a lot of people don't think about is that the eyes, skin, and brain are made of the same tissue when you are an embryo in your mother's womb. This is what we call neuroectoderm. And so whatever benefits the skin and eyes benefits the brain. Whatever benefits the brain benefits the other two. And whatever, here's the interesting part, whatever damages the brain, the skin, or the eyes does the same thing to all the other ones. So... This is something to consider when we're talking about toxic artificial light or sunscreen or sunglasses or any of these other things that artificially manipulate the full light spectrum. Brilliant. And, you know, you've touched on some things there, which uh, some people would say it's, it's in the realms of conspiracy theory. But obviously on Twitter, it's, it's a different kind of field. And there's always this debate about, you know, not expo getting exposed to the sun and, and, and sun creams. But whereas the others are like, these are that's what's causing the problem. What is your take like? Is some cream an absolute problem or is it needed, especially for young children, you know, especially with parents that are not our school when it gets hot, which is rare in the UK. They are very, you know, adamant that children need to wear sunscreen and sun hats and sunglasses. And well, what you're saying is this is actually counterproductive. 
yeah, it's counterproductive from a biological standpoint. I used to to stand on my soapbox and say, well, maybe there are some some times where you need sunscreen, but frankly, if if we're starting at that point with the discussion, people need to understand that they need to avoid being exposed to the sun for too long as opposed to wearing sunscreen. They're they're starting at the wrong point. Right. And so what we're talking about with sunglasses or sunscreen or or um, even glass windows being behind glass windows during a sunny day, we're just talking about how these things artificially manipulate the full light spectrum in harmful ways. Mm -hmm. So for example, with sunscreen, the, the entire purpose of sunscreen is to block UVA and UVB. But UVA stimulates nitric oxide in the skin and blood vessels, lowering blood pressure. UVB is where you actually produce vitamin D3. So why would you block the two light wavelengths that are necessary for some of the most powerful biological benefit involved? Like it just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. And then if you want to extrapolate on that point, you're also blocking melanin production, which is mother nature's sunscreen, which comes from UVA and UVB. So again, like people talk about avoiding sunscreen, avoiding sunglasses, but they're not good at breaking down the biological mechanisms involved. And once you do and try to explain it as a, you know, in layman's terms, then the light bulb in people's heads g goes off and it starts to make more sense as to why we want to avoid these things. Yeah, and this is probably a topic that we could go and spend hours and hours on, but why then are there not enough medical experts, actual doctors and professionals saying this, um, but instead saying the opposite? And in your opinion, obviously, you know, it's probably uh, a wide opinion out there, but in your opinion, why do you think that is? Um, I think it, it comes down to a few things. Number one, the, I mean, if we look back in history, the Flexner Report in the early 1900s did a number on the medical establishment. Um, it took doctors away from a more intimate uh, doctor-patient relationship. It convinced people that, you know, more of the holistic side of health was not needed and, and we need big pharma to solve a lot of these problems, quote-unquote solve a lot of these problems. Um, and so the, you, we have to consider the historical perspective from the Flexner Report, the influence that Rockefeller um, and a lot of these various figures had on the medical industry. And then we also have to think about the third, fourth, and fifth order consequences that that framework for the medical system has created that exact framework is found in the education that comes from um, the medical field so every neurosurgeon dermatologist ophthalmologist that that's educated in these matters is actually being i mean from my perspective i actually think they're being taught propaganda they're being taught a very small sliver of what it means to practice medicine and if you look at how the average dermatologist or MD or ophthalmologist talks about these things, I mean, it's just complete ignorance. Like for, for a dermatologist to say that a tan is a sign of skin damage is outrageous, knowing the, the history of melanin, knowing the, I mean, it, we literally have this stuff on PubMed. It, it takes a five minute search. <laughs> and then you consider the evolutionary adaptation um, of melanin and it's 500 million plus year history. The fact that it's found throughout nature, it just, again, this is one example of many that I can point out that just make no logical sense. Yeah. And, and I think, um, obviously pre COVID, you probably wouldn't get anyone to agree with you, but post COVID, maybe in your experience, you can tell me, are you now getting more, more and more people listening to this message and, and going against the experts? because of all the, the crap that happened during that period, I suppose there has been a, a damage to the reputation of experts and especially in the medical field mm. because of the whole COVID debacle. Like, uh, did you, or have you experienced a, a shift in the layman mindset towards this stuff now since that period or, or not? I would say I have, I, th I think people are more skeptical on mass. Um, now it just depends on what part of the population you're talking about. I mean, <laughs> there's still a, a lot of people that, go with a conventional narrative. They, they fully believe that, um, you know, locking people down was a great idea for, for the COVID situation. But, you know, I, I, I mean, that's besides the point. But I, I think people are waking up. I think a lot more people are waking up. And as a result, people are starting to ask questions around various things that are not even outside, that are even outside of, of the COVID situation, um, whether it be sunscreen or sunlight or nutrition um, various things involved. So, yeah, I, I definitely think that people are starting to pick up on these things. Mm -hmm. and, and what was your feeling during that COVID period? Like, maybe, maybe I ask you, were you vaxxed? And 
how how strongly do you feel against or for the stuff that was pushed out at the time? Yeah, no, there was no way from day one. I was skeptical. There was no way in hell that I was going to take anything that they were trying to prescribe me. Um, and uh, I, you know, I can't say that in the beginning I knew what I was talking about because obviously it was there. There were new events unfolding. There was new evidence to be to be exposed. And um, for me, I think maybe within six plus months of that situation, things started to come to light. And I was like, okay, this is probably BS. And lo and behold, three or four years later, it's complete BS. Everything from the fact that it's even called a vaccine when it's actually should be called an experimental uh, gene therapy, the fact that people got locked down, avoiding sunlight, vitamin D3, which is a powerful immunomodulator that protects the immune system. From every angle, you can talk about how there are many holes involved to this, this whole narrative. So absolutely no 100 percent. like i mean obviously you know we could pick holes in it all day long but for me at the time one of the biggest kind of red flags was the uh lack of having an opposing opinion um i mean because mm -hmm. there were some doctors there were some experts that were saying hang on a minute this isn't quite right and they were being shut down straight away um and then the narrative was this is it this is the correct way this is what you've got to do and the reason why that didn't sit well with me is because in my background as being a lawyer, like I, I did work in, in, in the negligence field and we did come across medical negligence and even in, in kind of uh, the certain other claims. What we always found was once you get a medical opinion for your side, the other side have their own medical opinion. Yeah. And there's always a debate back and forth. So you could have one person that suffered something, but you could have three or four different medical opinions on what the cause for that was meaning that there's always going to be a debate. There's always going to be a differing opinion but with COVID for some reason. It was like, no, we're not going to listen to that opinion. There is no other opinion. This is it. And if you don't accept this, you're a conspiracy theorist. You're putting people's lives in danger. You're, you know, this and that. And you then it was that labeling, which kind of like, this can't be right. And you, then, know, you know what we call that? We call that tyranny. Yes, I mean, somebody, somebody just has to read 10 minutes of four, Fahrenheit 451 to understand that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, and and then it was crazy because then they bought out this, you know, immunity. Like if these companies, vaccine companies do something wrong, they are not going to be liable for what happens. And that was mind blowing, especially from a, a legal perspective, because the basis of law is that you have recourse to legal rights if something goes wrong and you're taking that away, which just made it even worse. But for some reason, even in the legal field, the lawyers didn't pick up on this and, and that was you know kind of mind-blowing it just made you question not just the medical field but all of these industries whether it's the teaching whether it's the legal are we yeah. all growing in this society where we're just brainwashed into this system to accept what we're told but who's in fact reviewing the decisions that are being made at the top level mm -hmm. and i suppose this is probably why your fight is and mission is so big because you're fighting against this system where people at the top are putting out content and rules and it's just being accepted blindly by the masses. But then somebody like you comes across and you're saying, hang on a minute, this is not right. I suppose, do you face a lot of criticism and, and anger for what you're saying or are people more diplomatic in, in, in re receiving the message? <laughs> I've definitely received my fair share of criticism and, and, um, and anger directed towards me, but, uh, I, I think people are kind of hesitant to do that because they understand that, okay, this is a guy who's actually done his homework. So if you want to get into a debate about why sunglasses are good for you as opposed to bad, like I will actually break it down from A to Z. And that's because like I've actually dedicated myself to this field. Like I am an obsessive personality when it comes to this stuff. And so, um, and I, I almost approach it kind of how I approach competitive soccer too, or football for, for the European audience. Like the, it comes down to training it comes down to being obsessive with it, especially if you want to excel and if you want to get to the top 1% of the field. Um, and so I think there's an element of that. There's an element of me not backing down. I am, I'm very willing to call out stupid ideas. Um, and I'm very willing to check myself too. Like at, at the end of the day, I'm not infallible. People need to check me as well. And so I'm open to that discussion and open to that back and forth. Uh, but I think that yeah, in general, it's just about constant, never-ending education for me and just getting back to the basics. Like, what, what is the, the first principles of human biology? What are those? Okay, let's follow those. 
it, it just so happens to be that mother nature or God or the universe, whatever you want to call it, has perfected this system. So why would I have the hubris to try to go against it? Absolutely brilliant. I love that. I love that. Uh, and, and then obviously, you, you know, you've, you've done a lot of education, you've dedicated to the field. But how are you actually helping people? Like, is it a coaching program? Or, you know, do they go through certain exercises? What, what do you do to actually implement the change into men? And I suppose a follow on question to that is, does this only apply to men? Or, you know, are women affected the same? Mm. with the circadian rhythm stuff or is it slightly different with them with their hormones and um, the body clocks for especially around pregnancy for example like what's the uh, uh, opinion there yeah i mean it can be slightly different for for women because they're i, I believe their body is way more complex just because of uh, of the nature of having to carry mm -hmm. a, a baby around in their womb um but i, I think it applies to, to human biology at large so whether you're man woman whatever it, it applies I I across just, i just lost you there so um I just lost you there. So the last thing I heard was uh, the female body is a little bit more complex. Yeah. So I, I believe it applies to everybody, really. I mean, you could talk about genetic polymorphisms that are, are rare in the population, but these are the foundations of, of human biology. So um, it, it's going to apply to everybody for the most part. Outs yeah, I think that um, it's, uh, it's important for people to understand that the education piece is really is really key here and so that's why i've really dived into coaching people one-on-one -on -one. like I, I do place a big emphasis on twitter and, and trying to amass as, as much of a following as i can with this content but really a lot of the grassroots change happens one-on-one -on -one coaching and so if i can step into somebody's life and if they believe in me to help me guide them throughout all of these things including circadian health sleep training supplementation, whatnot, then I think we can have the, the best um, opportunity to change because once you impact one person's life and they, they carry that on for the rest of their life, then it translates into other people as well. Like, hey, it's word of mouth. Did you hear that sunglasses are actually bad for you? La, da, da, whatever. And so that's usually why I'm, I'm bigger on the one-on-one -on -one coaching. Absolutely brilliant. And, and I suppose we touched upon, you know, what the ideal morning routine is, but for maintaining the circadian rhythm throughout the day, I suppose, what's the ideal kind of daily schedule that somebody should have? Uh, and I suppose, you know, sleep is going to be an important to this. And, you know, there's different opinions out there that you need eight hours sleep or six hours is enough. Uh, maybe more, especially if you're athlete and training a lot, you need more kind of recovery. What is your kind of opinion on that? How much sleep is necessary? Uh, and I will have follow up questions to this, but I'll let you answer that first. I'd say at least seven and a half hours for most people. Um, and then, you know, the variance comes, um, like you mentioned, it comes at, as to whether you're an athlete, whether you're dealing with some sort of condition and you need more regeneration from sleep, um, you're training more. Yeah, so I'd say generally seven and a, seven and a half hours to maybe eight hours and, and 30 minutes at the most for, for the general population. Yeah, and, and I find it interesting because when I do get eight hours sleep, I tend to feel more groggy in the morning than when I get six hours. Now, mm. is that is that a circadian rhythm issue or is that just a, something else or what's the kind of take on that? It could definitely be a sign of circadian dysfunction, especially if you're not blocking artificial light after sunset. Um, because if you look at every hormone, I mean, melatonin follows a circadian cycle, so it's supposed to be very low, almost non-existent during the morning time and then very high at night. Um, although even near-infrared light from the sun stimulates a different form of melatonin, but that's besides the point. Um, and then cortisol is supposed to be very high in the morning and very low at night. So if you're noticing some grogginess, maybe you just haven't gone through all of the deep and REM cycles that you need, or maybe you're just waking up at a time where you're in the middle of a deep or REM sleep cycle. So that, that could be it. Brilliant. And, and when you say you need, you know, seven and a half hours optimal, is that all in one go or could you break it down throughout the day? And the reason I asked that is because in the UK, when we have our winters, you know, it's going to get daytime about eight o'clock in, in the morning and then sunset is around about four o'clock, which, which is fine. But then in the summer, it, it just goes to the other extreme where sunset is around about 11, 10, 11 p.m. And mm. sunrise is about three, four o'clock. So you're really getting three, four hours sleep, especially if you're trying to follow the, the prayers as well, because obviously we have the morning prayer um, and, and then the late night prayer. So, you know, you, you're getting three or four hours sleep um, and then it becomes difficult to maintain this routine of seven and a half hours and, and a typical routine. So the routine in the winter is completely different to the routine in the summer. 
uh, and I know there's a lot of Muslims that have had this question and they've not really found the answer for what the perfect kind of sleep cycle schedule should be. Can you offer any insight into that? Mm. I'm actually a big fan of following the seasons. I think that, I mean, it depends on where you live and, and we can get into the discussion of whether an individual belongs in the certain place that they live um, from the biological standpoint. But, yeah. you know, that for a lot of people, that's not going to be as, as practical or as convenient. And so I think um, treating sleep as a cyclical thing is very important. Like, you know, during winter, you'll sleep more. You'll probably sleep, sleep nine and a half hours sometimes. During summer, because you have typically have more daylight, you're going to be awake longer. And so I don't think we need to worry about, you know, getting four or five, six hours here and there. I think that um, the problems occur if you, if you chronically get three, four, five, six hours. If you're not, if you're not having this ebb and flow to sleep and you're not trying to maintain at least seven and a half hours for most nights mm -hmm. um, with the occasional sleep deprivation, then I think that's, um, that's going to be the most important thing for me. Yeah. And, and cause I remember, obviously I studied psychology at, at A level. So, you know, during the age of 16 to 18 and in one of the classes, they did talk about, you know, sleep deprivation and the effects of sleep deprivation. And uh, one of the ins uh, experiments that they conducted was depriving people of sleep. And obviously the longer they stay awake, the, the worse the condition gets uh, to the point where they become delirious and they start hallucinating and it becomes a very distressing uh, state of affairs, but it all kind of sorts itself out following one good night's sleep. Yeah. So is that something people would find more optimal where, okay, maybe they're not getting seven hours regularly, but if they go through maybe a week or two weeks of maybe not so much sleep, but then they just have one session of a good solid sleep, would that work or would that be out of alignment with, with trying to regulate the circadian rhythm? I, I think someone, someone in, in that circumstance is still going to be out of alignment from a circadian perspective. Um, because if you just like if you're comparing two or three weeks of suboptimal sleep and then one night of great sleep, I don't think it's going to do much. It's certainly going to help, but I don't mm -hmm. think it's going to do much over the long term. Um, and so I, I think the, the sleep schedule consistency is also a very important point. Like if you're going to bed at 10 p.m. one night, 7 p.m. the other, and then 3 a.m. the other, mm -hmm. that's actually a bigger problem than if you just maintained a, a consistent routine of midnight every single night. So you, you don't want to have that much variance because again, this game is about timing. Everything in relation to circadian biology is about timing. And if you throw that timing out of whack by, by just being all over the place and not having any consistency, especially with sleep, then, uh, then problems will definitely occur or the likelihood that they will occur, you know, rises exponentially. And the same thing applies to morning sun. Like if you can just nail down morning sunlight as soon as you wake up as a routine, that's fantastic from the timing perspective. Um, and so it's just being in alignment with really the movement of the sun, darkness, these these two aspects to um, the light and dark cycle. Yeah, and there's just so much, you know, cold in that. In that, When you talk about routines and, and uh, schedules, like the typical routine for the average person today is miserable job, <laughs> you know, all day. They come home and then the evenings are spent under unnatural light watching Netflix or TV or computer screens or the screens without any kind of protection. Um, and they're probably not going to sleep at, at regular times. And then they're wondering why they're depressed and they're miserable. Yeah. But you're basically saying here that your issue is that routine where you're exposed to unnatural light, you're exposed to screens that are harmful. From a practical point of view, then, what should a person in that situation do then? Should, is it just getting the glasses or, you know, what, what kind of practical steps can they take which don't feel overwhelming? Yeah. You know, um, maybe once, what's the first step they can take? And then the second step, I suppose, might be a better way to answer that question. Yeah, I mean, I think just aligning yourself with the light and dark cycle and doing these these small various things that don't feel overwhelming and stacking them onto each other is very important. Um, one thing that I figured out is that you know, so let, let's focus on the daytime, the morning time specifically. If you can just watch the sunrise or just be outside, that that makes a big difference for a lot of people. If you can um, expose a lot of your skin to that that morning sunlight, that makes an even bigger difference. And it doesn't take that much time. I mean, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I think that most people can carve out that amount of time. And then 
you know, I'm not for those people. I'm not as concerned during the midday, although there are some things that will help them. Um, I'm really focused on the morning time and then after sunset, most importantly. So if you can get a pair of the dark lens blue light blockers, that's great. Um, if you can get a pair of the circadian friendly bulbs and, and basically outfit most of your house with those, I think that's going to be a really good one because it's automatic. You just turn on the lights. You don't have to think about it. Um, and then covering up the skin after sunset is also important because of those light sensing proteins. So it's really just getting morning sunlight, getting as much of your skin exposed during the morning time, uh, maintaining a, a normal sleep schedule, like just go to bed at 10 p.m., wake up at sunrise, um, and then blocking artificial light after sunset. I think those are very achievable, achievable aims for people. Absolutely. And you know, maybe it, it'd be great for, for some of the audience to uh, hear some case studies of people you've worked with or maybe even your own kind of circumstances. Maybe what was the before of somebody that had a terrible circadian rhythm and malfunction, what you did to help them and what the end result has been uh, from yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've worked with a, quite a few clients who have noticed some substantial improvement. I mean, you could talk about... From the beginning of the of the program, my my work with them, they were at around 29% body fat. By the end of uh, the two months, and probably a month after that, so maybe three months after, they're at around 22, 23%, not including the fact that they were down to like 21%, but they just went off the rails for holiday. So <laughs> like those, those are not um, rare results because again, we're focused on circadian biology from a metabolic perspective so the metabolism works properly and then various things i mean within a few days of getting your light environment in check and doing these things um, brain fog goes away energy skyrockets um, mental clarity is through the roof you can actually focus on your work you're you're a lot more creative um, and so these various symptoms you know come together into one package and as a result people really feel a, a big difference in their life Absolutely, that's brilliant, and 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 I think I did see you maybe getting some stick on this on uh, on Twitter. Obviously, I think you're a parent recently, and uh, you've been exposing your ch child uh, to to natural sunlight without maybe yeah. um, you know any kind of sunscreen. Is that dangerous or not? Because uh, a lot of people will say that's very very dangerous, um, especially with the sensitivity that children have with their skin. Uh, how, how's the experience been for you, for you? Uh, what have you been doing, I suppose, uh, specifically for, for your child? Yeah. So, I mean, my, my son is almost seven months old. Um, his name's Enzo. So he's, he's, he's got speed in his nature. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is one of the most highly charged controversial topics out there. I think that, you know, when you get into the children or the territory of children, people, people go crazy. But mind? again, the same concept applies to infants. Um, the morning sunlight has no UV. So if you're telling me it's dangerous, that makes no sense from the morning perspective. Um, they, that actually primes their skin and, and regenerates the skin in order for them to be able to have some midday sunlight. And um, the, the midday discussion is where I think a lot of people have the most confusion because they believe it's just inherently dangerous to be out in, in UV conditions. Um, I don't believe in that at all. I think UV light's not a toxin at all. I think it's very important for human biology. And then most importantly, we have to understand that there's nuance involved. Yes, I mean, it can be dangerous if you leave your six-month-old out there for like three hours unattended, like obviously. <laughs> but if you take a, a normal, moderate approach, you'll understand that babies absorb more light, so their skin is a little bit more sensitive. Um, and as a result, they need less time in the sun. So five minutes, 10 minutes, the more you do morning sunlight, the more you can expose them to midday for, for a little bit longer. And just having some very wise practices around understanding the the solar cycle yourself so understanding what the uv index is understanding your own um relationship with the sun i think those things matter most as opposed to just you know coming um as opposed to just believing in the propaganda tactics that centralized medicine and these various people throw out at you uh, yeah i mean it's just so interesting because uh, it is a loaded topic um and then so in your opinion, then, the reason why people get sunburnt, even if they do go out for a few minutes, is because they haven't had enough exposure to the sun rather, and they haven't built up that kind of tolerance uh, rather than the sun being inherently dangerous to be out. Uh, yeah. If that's the case, then what should be... So somebody who goes out in, into the sun and within five minutes they get absolutely sunburnt, what should they do then to kind of build that tolerance? Is it the same thing, you know, expose yourself early in the morning or... Um, are there some other 
techniques that they could use to build up that tolerance so that they don't need to rely on sunglasses and sun cream whatsoever. Mm. So the the individual you described is at the highest risk for sunburn. So I would consider them almost like a, a redhead, ginger, maybe <laughs> maybe even albino. I don't know. But that that's an excellent point because if it works in the demographic that is at highest at the highest risk, it'll work for everyone else. Mm-hmm. And I can explain that from from a biological standpoint. But basically for that person, you'd really want to spend the majority of your time outside in the morning. You want to get as much of your skin exposed to the morning sunlight anywhere between sunrise and around 8 or 9 a.m. Um, and you want to repeat that consistently. You want to do this every single day for four to six weeks. Now, I, I don't recommend that you avoid midday sunlight. What my recommendation is for that person is probably to get one minute of midday UV, even one and a half minutes. I mean, I don't care how stupidly small that sounds. The point is that you need to develop the adaptation in order for you to handle more in the future. And so you have to start small. Like I I always relate it to this. The reason why we call it solar callus is because you're developing that adaptation in the same way that you are developing the adaptation in the gym. Like if you're a newbie in the gym, you're not going to try to squat 300 pounds off of the squat rack. Makes no sense. You will develop an injury and you can relate that to sunburns as being an injury in the same way because you don't have that adaptation built. Um, And so that's probably how I would approach it. And then also one other consideration, being very strict with blocking artificial light after sunset, because Mm -hmm. artificial light damages the skin. As a result, it makes the skin more vulnerable to burns during the day. And then again, the strict avoidance of sunglasses, sunscreen, being behind glass windows during the day, because that stuff is counterproductive. It will make you more susceptible to burns. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I love it. And I suppose that is another consideration, which, uh, um, probably a whole another topic in and of itself, but especially in the Asian community, I know this is big. They, or we, I suppose, they avoid the sun because of the insecurity of the skin getting darker. Yes. Um, and, and it's funny because obviously, uh, I suppose white people, they, they want the tan because that glow tan makes them look better looking, as they say. But for the Asian community, they don't <laughs> want to be out in the sun because they are going to get darker and that's seen as a an ugly trait i, I suppose uh, i mean uh, have you experienced that or what's your kind of take on that you know i was just having a conversation about this very subject with my uh, my coworker because i also work at a at an establishment where i do health coaching as well we do diagnostics dexafit or dexa scans it's called dexafit but dexa scans vo2 all that stuff and and we were actually talking about caste systems she was educating me on how you know th- this discussion of sunlight is not so foreign to the discussion of culture. I mean, they're, they both go hand in hand. And so I I don't know too much about what a caste system looks like, why people want to avoid getting darker. I mean, is it just because of your position in the hierarchy from a social, social perspective? I mean, the, the, the jury's out, but I would probably say it's got something to do with the colonial mindset. Um, (laughs) when, when the British took over, uh, India, um, white was seen as obviously upper class, rich um and and uh i mean it depends how how deep you want to go into it people might not agree with it but um there are those that say uh asians or dark people were taught to hate themselves because they were seen as slaves and and, and the higher race was the the lighter skin um and, and that colonial mindset is probably still there in, in that caste system so even if you go to places like india and pakistan there is a, a kind of privilege or higher status attached to to, to lighter skin uh and you know, if you look at some of the, the things over there that are kind of important or popular are the skin whitening creams. Uh, it becomes a bit of a meme. And But even like, I remember when when my first son was born, uh, obviously you get all the people congratulating you. But off-putting were, were those ones that, you know, the long distance relatives that hardly would speak to you, but they ring you, uh, congratulations. And then they ask, is it dark or is it light? <laughs> like oh. talking about the baby it's like what are you talking about here this is just outrageous I mean, so um and, and and you know it's 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 so natural because you he- would hear aunties and uncles or aunties more than often they're not don't go out in the sun your skin's gonna get dark uh so it's it's definitely something that's been breathed in why it's there obviously the jury's out but it's it's definitely an insecurity that's there uh and even peers on my age i i have heard so many people saying like i don't want to go out because i don't want to get dark uh, so it's definitely insecurity that's there 
uh, and I would say a lot of people avoid going out in the sun because yeah. of that, rather than you know the uh, health benefits and, and the impact on the circadian rhythm. Yeah, and, and it's really something we're going to tackle in depth, um, my coworker and I. I think that we're going to create some content around it because it's important to find this intersection between health, sunlight, and then uh, social or societal problems, um, especially with with that history. I mean, that's an incredible thing to to really understand because I, I think that people need to understand that that, that is an ass backward mentality. I mean, it, it goes against biology. It goes against the empowerment of a people, and. You know, I think that it gives us a good opportunity to understand that the more melanin you have, the healthier you are from an objective standpoint. So why would you take that as a negative thing? I think it's a, it's a source of empowerment. And really, we should be seeking to get darker. Because I think across most cultures in the world, a tan is seen as an objective sign of health. Mm -hmm. And I think that's some intuitive ancient wisdom or like a wisdom of the crowd that's involved in that whole discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a deep topic, I suppose. Every race, culture, creed is, is taught to hate themselves today. Uh, everyone's taught to have low self-esteem and insecurities because it's profitable. Right? You know, if you've got a problem yes. with yourself, you're going to start looking for solutions, whether it's this, the skin whitening creams or the fake tans or, you know, so it, regardless of what color or cultural background you're coming from, you are taught to believe that you are inadequate and you need pharmaceuticals or cosmetics to to basically uh, feel good about yourself so i suppose that you know that's the whole topic in in and of itself um but and i suppose this is probably why also going back to natural um you know the holistic kind of medicine is yeah. shunned upon because people are going to realize well hang on a minute i actually don't need to spend any money on this really to, to get back in into alignment so your fight isn't just societal conditioning it's with a billion trillion dollar industry that stops the profit if, if your message gets out into the mainstream. Oh, I, I'm very, I'm fully aware that I'm very dangerous for a lot of institutions <laughs> and a lot of people because they will, and, and you can tell that I am a threat to them because they will call me a pseudoscientist. They will call me a quack. They'll call me unscientific, even though I'm using the very centralized lens that they worship for their own research. And even then, their own research is piss poor because I'll give you a prime example. Every research done on the sunlight, quote unquote sunlight causing cancer, has been done using isolated UVA and UVB. What's even better is that they've used albino mice and rats as their subjects. Huh. So you're taking an isolated form of the full light spectrum, studying them in artificially blue lit conditions, which is inherently toxic, and then irradiating them with high amounts of, <laughs> of UVA and UVB with the, the highest susceptibility to skin damage because they're albino. And, and there are other factors involved, but that's just one example of how poor the quote unquote scientific evidence is on the centralized medicines um, side. And uh, what we're trying to do is educate people from a common sense first principles perspective. And we're, mm -hmm. we're taking a no bullshit approach to it. Absolutely, bro. and I love it. And I'm just conscious of the time. Uh, there was quite a few more things I want to get into, but quickly touch you on something you mentioned earlier. I would like to think athletes uh, and sports people would be more interested in in this kind of stuff. Um, obviously, with your kind of professional background as well, uh, are they in tune with this stuff, or do they just still follow the standard medical advice? I, I would say the general population is more at hip to this work than a lot of the athletes. I think the athlete population is, they kind of have this brute force approach to, to athleticism and, you know, um, in trying to optimize things. I don't think they're really concerned about optimizing things, to be honest, from what I've seen. I think a lot of athletes are, are trying to just, you know, um, fall to their own, whether it's athletic prowess or talent. Um, and I think a lot of that demographic needs some really important um, lessons on, you know, how to be more circadian friendly so that they can excel at the highest level. Because fundamentally, like being a professional athlete is inherently damaging to the body. I mean, you're mm -hmm. pushing the body to a very extreme mm -hmm. extent. So yes. they they need the circadian piece even more than gen pop. Brilliant, brilliant. And no, I absolutely love it. This has been an amazing conversation. Like I've learned so much and I'm so grateful that you've come on. Uh, maybe we can do a follow-up another time because there's just so much to unpack. Uh, yeah. But 
what is your kind of final message to, to the people watching? How should they deal with their minotaurs, especially with the circadian rhythm? Um, and any, any last words? Uh, you know, I would say, um, I think it's very healthy for people to have a, a doubt of seed or a, a seed of a doubt, sorry, seed of doubt planted in their mind because um, there are, are a lot of systemic centralized lies that are being thrown around. And um, I think it's very important for the population to be inherently curious and doubtful as opposed to just, you know, taking in of whatever information blindly that, that they're being taught. So, yeah, just just have some doubt, study, educate yourself on the circadian perspective, look at a lot of my work, a lot of other people's work in this realm. And I think you're going to come out with some very practical things that will really revolutionize your life. Brilliant. Love it. Absolutely love it. And, um, you know, just to finish off then, who is your ideal client? What can you offer them and how can they get in touch and contact you and find out more information? My ideal client is um, a man between his, I'd say, 25, maybe mid-20s to mid-60s. I mean, there is it's a pretty large gap, but there is no limit to it. Um, somebody who's curious, somebody who's willing to learn, somebody who asks a lot of questions, who's willing to check in consistently, and most importantly, somebody who's tired of dealing with poor health. And who's tired of being sick and tired so um outside of that you can find me on twitter instagram i'm sure you'll, you'll have the handles um, my website at zaidkdahaj.com and then uh from there you can just um even dm me about coaching and, and we can have a conversation but yeah man it's been a really fun convo brilliant i love it uh, and uh, i think I, I did mention this on on twitter a while ago you have maturity and intellect beyond your years and uh, I pay respects to that uh, keep doing what you're doing uh, love it and those links i will put them in the descriptions below uh, when this episode goes out once again Zed, thank you for being here and as for the viewer i hope you enjoyed this episode as much as i as i did and i will see you in the next one take care bye bye thank you